Last week, we began a new sermon series called How to Squander Your Potential. And our goal is not really to learn how to squander our potential. It's actually the opposite. We want to learn how to live into our potential, our, our God-given potential, right? And we're looking at King Saul in the book of First Samuel in the Old Testament. And, and Saul was a man who had a ton of potential. As we looked at last week, Saul comes from a very impressive family. And as far as physical attributes go, he was tall, dark, and handsome, right? So that's not too bad for a king. And, and his personality, at least in the beginning, it was humble and, and eager to serve. Saul looked like he was full of potential. But the first thing that Saul seemed to struggle with was his role as king. Having a human king was new to the Israelites. They, they, they had never had a human king before, and Previously, they, they, their leadership mainly came from judges, or otherwise known as prophets, who were mostly the mediator between the people and their real king, God himself. Yet in 1 Samuel 8, where really the story of Saul begins, we find that Samuel, the current prophet, is getting old, and the scripture says that his sons were corrupt. <laughs> and the Israelites were concerned about having to function under these sons of Samuel. So they asked Samuel for a king instead. Not just any king, but one like every other nation. And God gave in to this desire of theirs for a human king, even though he knew that putting that much power into, into a human would ultimately corrupt them. You remember God warned them, even before they started looking for a king, what a king would ultimately demand of them. And, and the truth is that the kingship of Israel was not going to be like the, the kings of all the other nations. It, ju it just couldn't be. You remember back then, in those days, the kings of other nations were looked on as gods, where the word of the king was tantamount to the law of the land. You needed to follow their commands without any question. And you can imagine that God, the God of the universe, was not so keen on, on that, especially knowing the corruptibility of hum humanity, right? So from the get-go, it was clear that the marching orders for this new king did not start with the king. It started with God, and then to his prophet, and then finally to the king. We see this in the very first order of the new king, Saul, in 1 Samuel 10.8, in his first official business, following his inauguration, what does Samuel the prophet tell Saul to do? 1 Samuel 10, 8 says, go, ahead, go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. <laughs> so who will tell King Saul what to do? <laughs> well, God does through his prophet. God is still very much involved, isn't he? God <laughs> is, is still kind of the king in place, isn't he? And this was really the first principle that, that King Saul needed to learn in order to not squander his potential. And that was to understand his role. And to his credit, Saul actually gets it, at least in the first battle in, in 1 Samuel 11 against the Ammonites. Through the strength of God's spirit, King Saul leads Israel to victory. And they all celebrated together what God had done that day. 1 Samuel 11, 15, so, so all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. There's this intertwining of God and king, but definitely God then king, isn't there? And we... We can understand this role and how, how this works in our own lives, right? We understand that we aren't just sitting around while, while, while God is doing all the work in our lives. God usually wants us involved. God wants us participating in his ways. But he doesn't want us to forget about who's behind us or even working through us, right? We need to remember him. And this isn't too difficult to keep straight in our lives especially when things are going well, when we're sitting in comfy chairs in, in our beautiful sanctuary, uh, even when things are, are 
coming at us a little slower, right? Those, those are times when we can make some really strong decisions and remember that God's a part of our lives. But when life gets tough, when life gets hectic, sometimes we can get distracted, can't we? Our eyes can get stuck more on what's in front of us than who is with us. True? And this is what happens to King Saul when the more formidable enemy, the Philistines, actually show up in 1 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 5 says this, The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. <laughs> wow, right? And we see the response from the troops of Saul uh, in verse 6. When, in, in, when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and their army was hard-pressed, they hid. <laughs> they hid in caves and thickets among rocks and pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. This wasn't good, right? This would have been a little distracting for this young king, I'm pretty sure. And to, king's credit, and to King Saul's credit, he does start off on the right foot, actually. actually. He, we find him at this point in the story, in Gilgal, waiting for the prophet Samuel to show up to tell him what God wants him to do. Good job, Saul. But he couldn't wait there too long, you know. The enemy's at the door. His troops are scattering. Something has to happen, and it has to happen soon. You ever been there before? Pressed on every side, wanting God's help? I know you've been there before. Well, you know the rest of the story. King Saul, he ends up giving up on Saul showing up, and he steps out of his role as king, and he takes on the more priestly function of offering the burnt offering to God. And then, of course, Samuel shows up just as Saul's finishing, and he rebukes Saul for doing such a foolish thing and not keeping the command of God. Command. Singular. What's the command of God? Well, this command here is, is to wait, right? Wait on the Lord. But ultimately, it's also about keeping his role straight, not going off trying to do things in your own power, but trusting in God's power and God's wisdom, right? We have to remember that he is the creator and we're, we're the creation, right? He is God. We are not. Getting this mixed up, not understanding our roles, certainly will help us squander our God-given potential, wouldn't you say? Now, I know that this seems like a long introduction to this week, right? But, but we actually start off this week's story where we la last, ended last week. So I needed to get all of that in there. <laughs> As we enter into the story this morning, the Philistines are still at the doorstep, right? And things are still looking pretty bad for Israel. They're in the exact same situation. In fact, in the very next verse, following Samuel's rebuke of Saul, in verse 15 says this, Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeon and Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were there with him. And they numbered about 600. 600. Think about this. Samuel has left the building, right? And Saul is left with 600 soldiers <laughs> versus a countless army, right? Verse 5 told us, numerous as the sand on the seashore. And then, then the Bible gives us this additional detail in, in verse 22 of chapter 14. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword, sword or spear in hand. <laughs> Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. So sticks and stones versus metal. It's no wonder the troops had scattered, right? So as we move into 1 Samuel 14, our story today, the, the Israelites are outnumbered in every way possible. So what happens next? Well, Jonathan, Saul's son, actually happens next. But before we can get into that, I have to point out a detail that we find in, in chapter 14, verse 2. It says this, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migran. With him were, were his 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was a son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, 
son of Phinehas, the, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. Now, what does this all mean? Saul obvious, obviously had alienated Samuel in the story that we looked at last week. He lost Samuel as an advisor, right? So Saul seems to have brought in this new spiritual advisor into his life named Ahijah, whose bloodline comes from Eli, who actually was the prophet who was before Samuel, right? And if you do some reading into Eli's family's life in the first few chapters of 1 Samuel, you will know <laughs> that this was one messed up group. In fact, most scholars, when they're referencing Eli, usually they say the rejected <laughs> priestly line of e Eli. So not a great bloodline for Ahijah. In fact, back in 1 Samuel 4, when this dark time in Israel's history, when Eli's family is running around, um, when that history is drawing to a close, the ark of God has actually been captured by the enemy. And Eli, the prophet at the time, he's hearing the news about the ark being captured and, and that his two sons have been killed in battle and, and he just literally falls backwards in his chair and he dies. And, and after that, just shortly after that, his daughter-in-law dies in labor. But not before she names his son Ichabod, who later would become Ahijah's uncle. Listen to this in verse 20. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair, you've, you've given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention to what that lady said. She named the boy Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So fittingly, and literally, the nephew of the glory has gone. The nephew of the presence of God and gone, or presence of God is history, right? That's the that's the actual name of Ichabod, has now become the spiritual advisor to Saul. Keep that thought in your minds as we continue through this story. Back to Jonathan in, in 1 Samuel 14. While well, while Saul is in Gibeah with his 600 troops, right? And, and everyone's just kind of backpedaling away from this huge army. Here is Jonathan and, and his armor bearer there at the front lines all by themselves. And, and you can hear the faith of Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men, the Philistines. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So Jonathan and his armor bearer decide to attack a Philistine outpost by themselves, right? They take out 20 men and they win. And God uses this victory in this unbelievable way. Listen to what happens next in verse 15. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding, raiding parties. And the ground shook like the earthquake we experienced recently. It was a panic sent by God. Saul's lookouts at Gibeah and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. You can just imagine what they're thinking. What in the world's going on out there? Then Saul said to the men who were there, let's find out who's over there. Muster the forces. See who's left. Who's left us. And when they did, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. And Saul says to Ahijah, bring the ark of God. At that time, it was with the Israelites. What's he, what's he going to do with the ark of God? That's, that's kind of a question that goes through my mind. The ark of God is the symbol of the presence of God. And you can just imagine with Saul not having Samuel there, not being able to, to ask Samuel for, for advice, that Saul's really wanting Ahijah to use the ark to find out what God wants him to do. And then verse 19 happens. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul then says to the priest, withdraw your hands. In other words, <laughs> sorry priest, I don't need you to try to figure out what the will of God is now. <laughs> I can see it happening in front of me. God is at work. <laughs> 
I know what I'm supposed to do. So verse 20, Then Saul and all his men assembled and went to the battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion. They were striking each other with their own, with their own swords. Then we see in verse 22, When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines, Philistines were on the run, they, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel and the battle moved on beyond Beth Avon. <laughs> What's interesting, though, is right in the middle of this great celebration of victory, we find, about, find out about this curse that the King Saul has put in place upon his soldiers, keeping them from actually eating food throughout that day. Verse 24, now the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath, saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. <laughs> now think about that. Whose enemies are these, really? Saul? <laughs> Not yours. I mean, how often do we take on enemies that we consider enemies of God and God hasn't made them enemies. And there's no law of God against eating while in battle, so Saul's kind of ratcheting things up to maybe bring pleasure to the Lord. Does, does God bring, gain pleasure by us torturing ourselves more than he'd want us to? Again, Saul's forgetting his role. And now your troops, Saul, are in pursuit into the woods, chasing after this Philistine army, and they are running out of gas. Verse 25, the entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out, yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath. But you remember that Jonathan didn't know about that oath. That would have happened while he was out on the front lines and everyone was hanging back, right? So verse 27, Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath. So he reached out the end of the staff that was in his hand and he dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened it. It strengthened him. Then one of the soldiers told him, Your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food today. And that is why the men are faint, is what the soldier said. And, and listen to the response that, that Jonathan, the son of Saul, provides for this, this other soldier. Jonathan said, My father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey? How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? Think about this. What do we know about Jonathan so far? Well, we know that he's a man of faith, right? He's clearly that. He believes in the power of God. He's taken on the Philistine army by himself. Him and his armor bearer. And he, he obviously isn't afraid. <laughs> isn't afraid to take on the enemy. He isn't afraid to speak his mind, even if his dad is the king, right? And Jonathan seems to have a pretty good head on his shoulders. He seems to be pretty wise. But it's also clear that Jonathan is not <laughs> one of his father's advisors. Or maybe Saul would have asked him about this whole edict to not eat on a day of battle. Maybe Saul would do well to include Jonathan as one of his advisors. Well, at this point in the story, evening is finally coming, which means what? <laughs> this means the soldiers can eat, and they are ready to eat. And there's plunder all around them, so the men just go crazy after the food because they're, they're famished, right? Give me food! <laughs> Verse 31, That day after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ajalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and taking sheep, cattle, and calves. They butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. They were hungry. They were ready to eat. But there's a problem here, isn't there? Israelites weren't allowed to eat meat with blood still in it. <laughs> Verse 33, Then someone told Saul, Look, your men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. 
And again, to Saul's credit, he responds to this situation. He, he says to his soldiers, you have broken faith. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, go out among the men and tell them, each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and tell them and eat them. Saul was telling them that to hang their animals, the animal carcasses on this big boulder so that they could drain the blood out, right? Saul saying, do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. And really we see King Saul handling this, this situation pretty well. But we have to remember that this happened because he didn't allow his soldiers to meet. That's why there's this frenzy towards the food. He was the one to blame, actually, for this response to the meat. And then later that night, verse 36, King Saul seems to come up with another one of his not-so-thought-out plans. Verse 36 says, let's, let's go down and, and pursue the Philistines by night. Plunder them till morning, till dawn. And let us not leave one of them alive. And you know what? The men were feeling good. They had had something to eat. They would kind of gotten a taste of the plunder, and they didn't mind getting a little bit more, right? So their response was pretty good. Do, do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest, it's kind of interesting that Ahijah actually speaks up here. He says, let us inquire of God here. So Saul does that. He says, Saul asks God, shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hands? But God did not answer him that day. Really, and if you really look at the story, God hasn't spoken that we can see since Samuel left. Yet Saul, finally noticing that God has been silent, takes this on as judgment. He thinks that there must be something wrong, and that's why God's not speaking. And, and to be honest, if you look at the story, there's lots of things that went wrong. There's really not really anyone innocent in this story. Saul's made some wrong choices, and the men have done some things that they shouldn't have done. Really, maybe... Jonathan's about the only ones that's innocent in this whole story. And, and we also know from first-hand experience that God, God doesn't always speak on our timetable when we would like him to. So to assume judgment because you haven't heard immediately back from God. But King Saul decides to have his priest find the one who, who had sinned. And the lot falls to his son, Jonathan. Verse 42. After the law, lot fell to Saul and Jonathan, rather than the other leaders, it's, Saul said, Cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and, and now I must die. He seemed to be actually okay with that. <laughs> And Saul agreed with them. May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. Sorry, son. <laughs> now, if you follow the story, Jonathan, again, didn't even know about the curse, didn't even know about the command that, that King Saul had put on the, the soldiers. He didn't find out about it until after he had eaten the honey. This doesn't seem to be a fair judgment, does it? especially since Jonathan was used by God to bring the victory in this battle in the first place, right? But this is some way, in some way an, another thing that, that we get if we have human kings. <laughs> Unfair judgment, especially rush judgment with Saul. Limited knowledge, not knowing the whole story. Again, another rash, ill-advised decision of Saul doing something that looks to be very unfair but thankfully in this story at least the men stand up for Jonathan verse 45 but the men said to Saul should Jonathan die he who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel never as surely as the Lord lives not a hair of his head will fall to the ground for he did this today with God's help the men really looked like they were ready to revolt <laughs> 
And so Saul backs down, doesn't he? So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. And then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they withdrew to their own land. So let's just sum up this story here. This story seems to be about King Saul's advisors. Who was giving him advice? You know, he'd already alienated himself from Samuel, the prophet, back in the last story. And and with Samuel goes God, right? And by the end of this story, he's alienated himself from Jonathan, his own son, um, and possibly another good advisor for him if he would just go to and ask for help. And even his troops, by being unfair to Jonathan, had, had turned on him to some degree. All he has left is his chaplain, who doesn't seem to be really the best option to be an advisor. And Saul never does seem to follow through with any of the conversations that he has with Ahijah. So even maybe even his chaplain may be a little bit upset with Saul. So here King Saul is, no real voice in his life, all this rash thinking, jumping from this to that, when he really, really needs this true voice of reason. This lack of wisdom in his life surely was going to hold him back from fully living into his God-given potential. I had a chance to go see Myrna and Dale this week, and I got to see this, this coolest of clocks that Dale is working on, and, and it reminded me of this story. A man walked past a a clockmaker's store on the way to work every day. And each day he would stop outside the store and he would synchronize his watch with the clock that stood in the window of the the clockmaker's shop. While observing this daily routine, one day the clockmaker decided to step out and actually strike up a conversation with this man and and ask the man where he worked and, and The man timidly kind of confessed that he was the timekeeper at the factory nearby and he admitted to the the clockmaker that his watch didn't really keep very good time. And and since it was his job to ring the closing bell every day at 4 p.m., he had to actually come by every day and synchronize his watch to guarantee the precision of that time. (laughs) Well, the clockmaker, who was even more embarrassed than the timekeeper, uh, said, you know, I hate to tell you this, but my clock doesn't work well either. (laughs) In fact, I've been adjusting it to that bell that I keep hearing every afternoon at 4 o'clock at the nearby factory. It's all in our text today illustrates what happens to an individual who is turned away from God um, to find another opinion. And maybe that opinion is even his own opinion, right? Right? Both are like relying on a malfunctioning watch that is timed every day to a bad clock, right? And to tell you the truth, there are times when I don't look uh, too far off from this. You know, it really is kind of difficult in this day and age with all the many voices speaking in our world. They all seem to say that they're experts, but they're all saying different things. So, who do I trust? Have you ever been there before? Wouldn't it be best to choose the most reliable voice for our lives? Who might be that voice? The God, the creator of the universe? Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are so thankful that you desire to be a part of our lives. You are interested in the things that we do. And you want us to participate in your ways. You want us to be a part of the things that you are doing in this world. And so God, would you help us to remember you? Would you help us to think through the fact that we need your wisdom We need your strength. We need your help. And for us to to continue to reach out to you and remember that, that you are right there with us. Lord God, 
Help us to trust in the more reliable voice in our lives. Help us to trust in you. And we will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the benediction passage this morning is, actually comes from Proverbs. Proverbs 15, beginning with verse 29. It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart, and good news gives health to the bones. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. Those seem to be really good words to live by. People of God, Let's make sure that we draw near to the Lord for His wisdom and His strength and His help this week. Let us work at staying humble. Let us work at at giving life-giving words to those around us. People need to see and hear the hope that we have. So let's make sure that we share the more reliable voice. Let's stay close to God, shall we? You are sent.